You might be forgiven in thinking that on a track bed, the most expensive part of the bed is the rails. Yeah, they're not cheap, but that's not what makes up the majority of the permanent weir's budget. In fact, you gotta look a little lower. No, it's not the chairs or even the sleepers. It's the smallest yet most vital element, the ballast. You might be thinking, why are we talking about stones? This is a railway channel. Yet without those little stones, the UK network would barely survive and it's considered one of the most important components of the track itself. Now, no one is really sure who was the first railway to use ballast or where the idea specifically came from. But prior to ballast use, rails would be laid on any hard surface. Early railway workers would pound the ground with huge stone blocks to level the ground before laying them, giving the track a level footing. But embedding the stone into soft ground gave the tracks too much movement and variance that the track was wearing out in weeks. Railways needed a better solution. The first ever documented mention of a stone ballast track bed originated in Tyneside and strangely its story starts away from the tracks and on the dockside. Merchant ships laden with coal would leave the dockside for the far reaches of the world, but when the coal was emptied, the ship's now empty hulls became rather unstable and prone to sinking in high seas. To stabilise the ships, the ships would be reloaded with coarse stone called ballast, equal to the weight of the unloaded coal. This ballast would then be unloaded at Teesside, ready for the ships to be loaded again, but this left the dockside with several tons of useless stone. Near to the dockside was a tramway, and it was difficult to lay down stone foundations. So the workers at the dockside decided that the stones were perfect for packing under and around the sleepers that the trams ran on. What they discovered was nothing short of genius. The stones provided a perfect bed for the sleepers and the tracks. Because of the way that they were raised up, they provided great drainage from water, decreased chances of vegetation growing, and they stopped the sleepers from spreading while giving a solid yet slightly flexible track bed and the, for the trains above it. It also helped the workers with their huge stone problem. The stones would distribute the weight evenly across the whole way and straight away people began to notice the difference. Other materials for ballast would include the local slag from the way steel works and even ash deposits from the engines themselves. The best source of stone were the sharp, rugged ones. These core stones would interlock with each other, giving total strength along the line. It does seem strange to make a solid structure out of loose stones, but the benefits outweighed any shortfall, and the amount of ballast can vary depending on the track's use. It's been universally decided that there should be at least six inches of ballast laid to support the sleepers, but in some cases where the line comes under heavy or high speed use, then the ballast can be up to 20 inches deep. As with anything, ballast needs constant maintenance. For any permanent way, the most important factor is to maintain a good top line. A flat surface reduces stress on the rails and the chairs, so it's important that the sleepers are checked regularly. If the ballast stones have broken up under the weight of the sleepers and the trains, then this can cause weakness and void pockets under the sleepers, causing the sleepers and the rail to dip. To stop this, workers would use what they call crib ballast. The sleeper is lifted and the stones are packed tightly in the void. In the days before machines, this would be packed and forced down by hand. But with today's modern network, workers used engines called tamping trains. There's different kinds of tamping machines depending on the type of track. For example, plain line tamping are perfect for lines with no complex structures like points or crossing. They're brilliant along long routes like the East Coast Main Line, where the track can stretch for uninterrupted for miles, or shorter routes along heritage railways. These have fixed heads, whereas switch tamping machines have movable heads and are adaptable for problematic areas such as outside of large stations where there's a lot of points and junctions, and areas such as switches and crossings. Some engines are even equipped to make minute adjustments to the tracks to keep it at the correct gauge. When the tamping train comes over an afflicted sleeper, it settles over it. The lifting unit lifts the sleeper up and into its final position, exposing the void underneath. The tamping units then come into play. 
They drive probes called tines into the ballast and at either side of the void. Now the tines then vibrate at 35 hertz. This, the frequency is specific. Too little and the stones won't move. Too much and the stones will break. The vibrations cause the stone to move almost like a liquid. The tines then move under the sleeper, taking the stones with them and filling that void. Because the stones are rough, they interlock with one another and make it like an almost concrete strength. Once the hole is filled successfully, the tines are then removed and the lifter can let go. Only then can the train move to the next sleeper. When performed, it only takes a few seconds per sleeper and if the machine is equipped, it is then that the track alignments are also done. One of the more common tamping machines that you find in the UK is the 093X, also known as the Tamping Express. This yellow hulk was created by Plaza UK. The diesel power engine is equipped with 48 tamping tines and can tamp up to three sleepers at a time, as well as using laser guided technology for precise leveling and computer aided guidance. It can make short work of the larger mainline stretches and works continuously, moving at a rate of about four to five miles an hour. Although some railways have removed ballast from their tracks for good, for the UK, these machines are vital for keeping the trains running. You can see several of these machines around the country and there's always one or two idling past Skelton Junction on York. They are quite rare to see working as many work at night especially on branch lines and in between mainline trains. But the telltale signs they have been there are there. If you look out at the ballast and the ballast has neat and tidy ridges in them, it is a surefire sign that a tamping train has paid the line a visit. 